Hello, so good of you to drop by again. Welcome back to the Gallery of Curiosities. I am, as always, your humble host, Osgood. You're just in time to see my latest acquisition. I won it at an estate auction this morning. Look, an intact Edison wax cylinder. I'm not exactly sure what it contains, but here, hmm, the tag on the side, this might give us a clue. Quite nice handwriting, I must say. The cursive is rather faded, but here, hmm, you read it. Oh, I keep forgetting that they no longer teach cursive in the schools these days. Here. I shall have to do it for you. It reads, To the urgent attention, Feldmarshal von Hindenburg. Transcript of a recording on a damaged wax cylinder recovered from the ruins of Menlo Park. There were no other items in the box, so it would appear that the transcript was lost. But... It just so happens that I have an Edison wax cylinder player. Does that surprise you? So, let's take a listen and hear exactly what we've found, shall we? They die because I love. Because I love too much. Though I never raised an arc caster, nor primed a Redkin mine, how can the death and destruction they wrought be credited to any but me? Mina, you must know I did not want any of this for you, for the children. I set out to better our world, and I did. I said, let there be light, and there was light. I breathed life into still pictures. I snatched voices from the air, wrapped and packaged them for public consumption. They called me a wizard, and I was. I thought myself better than mortal man, and so did justify my actions through divine right. Woodward, Hammer, Westinghouse, Tesla, I see their faces every time I close my eyes, illuminated not by the flickering flame of lamp or candle, but by the strong, unwavering glow of incandescent light. They hate me, you know, especially the last. Would that I had heeded that damnable serve. If I am a wizard, Tesla was a prophet. I drove him from America and Britain, laughed from across the Atlantic as he peddled eccentricities to Bismarck and Franz Joseph. Third-rate ideas for third-rate Powers, I joked when President Wilson came to call. The Kaiser promised Germany's boys would be home before the leaves fell, and he was right. What could bullets and artillery shells do against induction shields? How could mere trenches shield men from an enemy who could tear the very earth asunder. I couldn't have known what they were capable of, any of them. 
It's a poor excuse, I know. But I was blinded by love for my creations, for my legacy. It was not Wilson's threats that impelled me. Jail, exile, death, all nothing compared to the horrors of obscurity. I gave them war dynamos. I gave them power sinks. I gave them galvanic trip hammers enough to pound the Mechanicer Corpse dreadnoughts to scrap. But most importantly, and perhaps most cruelly, I gave them hope. I loved my legend, my legacy. I love them too much. I can admit that now, although it is far too late. Even now, the Blitzstaffel ironclads churn New Jersey soil beneath their tooth tracks. Bioelectric inhibitors sweep the city, soldiers falling like unstringed puppets before clouds of rolling thunder. I know we will keep fighting, keep dying. Little enough time remains. That is why I must do this. I gave the world light, and I can take it away. For you see, I know where the energy really comes from. History will vindicate me. My only regret is that you will never hear this message. Although, perhaps, that is for the best. Give my love to Theodore, Charles, and Maddie. As always, you remain in my thoughts. Thomas. Well, I do believe we found a glitch in the Matrix. Not the first one for me. Have you ever met those dreadful men in the black suits? No? Well, they continue to try to take these sorts of things away from me. I will have to keep this one in the safe room with my other anomalous artifacts. Now, let's have our main story. Joe Vasicek is the author of more than 20 science fiction books, including The Star Wanderers and Sons of the Starfarer series. As a young man, he studied Arabic and traveled across the Middle East and the Caucasus. He currently lives in Utah. It will be read for us by Mr. C.B. Droge, an author and voice actor from the Queen City. He is the host of the weekly flash fiction podcast from Manawaka Studio. Find him online at cbdroge.com. The Gettysburg Paradox by Joe Vasacek. Fix bayonets. The order from Colonel Lawrence Chamberlain filled Leroy with a thrill unlike he'd ever known. This was it. The moment he'd waited so long for. The moment he'd traveled almost 200 years through history to experience. All around him, the dead and dying bodies of men in blue and gray littered the forest slopes of Little Round Top. The biting stench of musket smoke hung like brimstone in the air, while the thunder of enemy cannon boomed in the distance like the drums of hell. Leroy's hands shook as he clumsily fitted the bayonet to the end of his rifle. He had known that the fighting would be hard, 
but nothing could have prepared him for this. Wave after wave of Confederate soldiers had charged endlessly up the hill, reaping death and carnage. A part of him screamed to use the time slip device in his coat pocket to escape the horrors of the battlefield, but he grit his teeth and forced the cowardly thought from his mind. This is it, he told himself, the greatest moment of glory you will ever know. The charge of the 20th Maine, the daring bayonet charge that had single-handedly saved the Union Army on the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg. In that moment, when the outcome of the battle, indeed of the war itself, stood poised on the edge of a knife, those 300 Mainers had done more to affect the course of history than any other regiment in the war. And now, Leroy was about to be part of it. Right wheel forward, came Chamberlain's piercing voice, and the blast of the bugle sounded like the trumpets of a heavenly host. Now the left flank took up the yell, sweeping down to meet the rebels head on. The sharpshooters of Company B, hidden behind a stone wall down the slope to the east, stood and fired into the Confederate flank, sowing death and confusion among their ranks. Now Leroy's company had taken up the charge, and he was running headlong down the hill with the rest of them. The battle cries of the men in blue stirred something primal in his heart, and the horrors of the battlefield blurred before him. All he knew was smoke and sweat and dust and blood. All around him, the men of the 15th Alabama dropped their muskets and lifted their hands in surrender. Others tried to run, tripping over the rough terrain or falling to the ground in exhaustion. The charge gave way to a rout as the men of the 20th Maine reduced the rebels to a disorganized mob. Leroy ran breathlessly with his musket held high. About halfway down the hill, he stopped in front of a gray-coated rebel who had risen unsteadily to his feet. The man raised his hands in surrender, but his eyes were full of fury, not fear. That was when Leroy saw the time slip device gripped firmly in his right hand. The South will rise again, he shouted before disappearing into thin air. Stunned, it was all Leroy could do to hold on to his musket. What the? His breath came in short gasps, but his mind raced in horror. Time travelers in the 15th Alabama but the temporal police strictly forbade time tourists from taking a side that could change the course of history. Indeed, Leroy had only managed to join the 20th Maine by hiring a black market Russian company to insert him. But if there were time tourists on both sides... The Union soldiers streamed all around him as the charge continued down the hill, but Leroy hardly noticed them. The fury in the rebel time traveler's eyes still haunted him, and his parting words, The South will rise again rang like the thunder of cannon fire in his ears. Night fell soon after the main assault, but skirmishing continued long into the evening. Leroy gripped his musket with sweaty hands as the crack of potshots sounded down the hill. With the other soldiers of the 20th Maine, he spent most of the evening moving rebel prisoners. By the time he had returned to the camp, the twilight was fading and the stars were shining in the 19th century night. Far from reveling in the historic victory that had been his privilege to witness, Leroy couldn't stop thinking about the time-traveling Confederate soldier. He knew fully well the significance of the events he had just experienced. The Civil War had been a lifetime obsession with him, and he'd spent more than 10 million 22nd century dollars for the privilege of witnessing the war's most crucial turning point firsthand. But now, doubts were beginning to creep up on him, doubts about the effectiveness of the temporal police and the historical purity of the battle. When a time tourist went back to some great and pivotal event, there was always a danger that the flow of the timeline would be altered. Normally, events had a way of working themselves out, and when tourists were too careless, the temporal police would swoop in and arrest them before their carelessness led to disaster. Thus, continuity of the timeline was strictly preserved. But how could the temporal police have allowed anyone to fight on the Confederate side? The fighting on Little Round Top had been so tenuous, something as small as a stray bullet could have changed everything. If Colonel Chamberlain had been killed before ordering his boys to fix bayonets, or if Lieutenant Melcher had been shot down as he ran the head of the charge, the day could have ended in disaster. Why then had there been time travelers on both sides of the engagement? Had a tourist somehow slipped past the watchful eyes of the temporal police? Or worse, had some insane fanatic gained access to a time-slip device. 
Leroy had no answers to these disturbing questions. He considered using the time slip device to return to the 22nd century and inform the authorities, but that would mean giving up his chance to witness Pickett's charge on the third day. With the strings he'd had to pull and the hoops he'd had to jump through just to join the 20th Maine, he doubted that he'd get another chance to come back to Gettysburg once he left. There was another option, though. On the long march to Gettysburg, Leroy had noticed a soldier in Company B fiddling with what looked like a time slip device. Important historical events like Gettysburg always brought in a hefty profit, so it made sense that Leroy wasn't the only time traveler. Neither of them had spoken to each other. For all Leroy knew, the man still thought of himself as the only time tourist in the regiment. But if there was anyone Leroy could speak to about his concerns, it was him. He found the sharpshooters of Company B gathered around a campfire, laughing and smiling as they exchanged stories. A couple tin flasks of spirits were making their way round, and the rosy cheeks and bloodshot eyes showed that the festivities had been going on for some time. The time tourist was right in the thick of them, laughing as hard as any of the others. Leroy hesitated, wondering if now was a good time. He stepped back into the woods and pulled out his time slip device, setting it back an hour from the present. After a brief moment of disorientation, he looked up to find the sky still lit in the purple hues of twilight. A short distance away, the men of Company B had just sat down to supper, with tin plates in their laps and a steaming pot of porridge suspended over the fire. The men carried on just as merrily as before, but were much more sober. The time tourist was seated on the exact same rock as before, or as after. Leroy took a deep breath and stepped out of the shadowy wood. Good evening, gentlemen. Evening, Corporal, said the company sergeant. What can we do for you? I would like to have a word, if I may, with Private... Leroy stared at the time tourist, his name suddenly escaping him. Private Jones? Yes, Private Jones. It's about a personal matter. Private Jones rose slowly to his feet, a queer look on his face. Corporal Leroy, is it? What can I do for you? Leroy took the man by the arm and led him away from his comrades, who stared flatly at them as they left. There's something we need to talk about where the others can't hear us. What do you mean? Leroy fished into his coat and pulled out the time slip device. I trust that you recognize... Oh, another time traveler, said Jones, loud enough that everyone could hear him. Come, why don't you join us? Leroy's eyes widened as Private Jones pulled him back to the campfire. The men of Company B rose and greeted him with brotherly slaps and vigorous handshakes. Far from shock and disbelief at the discovery of a time traveler in their midst, the men greeted him as if he were one of their own. Another one, eh? Which company are you attached with? Are you 22nd century or 23rd? Lovely battle today, wasn't it? Lovely. But, but, Leroy stammered. His stomach grew sick as realization slowly dawned on him. The men around the campfire, indeed almost the whole of Company B, weren't 19th century natives at all, but time travelers just like him. Have a seat, have a seat, said the company sergeant, a round-faced Irishman with fiery eyes and a thick red beard. Corporal Leroy, is it? Sergeant Owens of the 22nd century, pleased to be making your acquaintance, sir. You're all time travelers? Owens chuckled and slapped him heartily on the back. That we are, lad, that we are. Oh, not the whole company. Uh, Captain Morrill is native. But as for the rest of us, let's just say we've come a long way to see this day. But you were the ones who fired into the rebel flank during the bayonet charge, said Leroy, his heart racing. I if it weren't for your company, the rebel line might have held and... And the brave charge of the 20th Maine would have ended in disaster, Owens interjected. A good thing we showed up in time then, eh, boys? The men roared with laughter at the offhand joke. Leroy only stared at them dumbfounded, his eyes wide with horror. You deliberately altered the timeline. Bloody right we did, said Owens, the Irish twang in his voice ringing like a bell. And a right good thing, too. But what about the temporal police? Didn't they try to stop you? You mean Hitler's time cronies? One of the men asked. We took care of them when we joined the 20th Maine, Jones explained. Gave them a proper runaround. Only some of them, though, said Owens, his eyes gleaming. The rest... He made a cutting motion across his throat and grinned. Dear God, Leroy thought. They killed the time police. Sergeant Owens pulled a tin flask of spirits from his coat pocket. When the Union wins this battle, those rebel dogs will melt away like dew before the sun. 
Not even Lee's genius will be enough to save them. And the Allies will be a force to be reckoned with. The Third Reich will fall. Wait, the Third Reich? Leroy asked, his head reeling in confusion. What are you talking about? Why, the Nazis, of course. That's why we're here, to unite the Americans so they can help us defeat Hitler. Oh, I don't know about all that, said a man with a thick black beard. Hitler's not that bad. I'm just here to prevent the Second Civil War. I want to see this country rise to greatness and take her rightful place in the world. He's from a different timeline, Owen said, as if that explained everything. But one thing we can agree on is the Union has bloody well got to be preserved. Hear, hear! Wait, you're from a timeline where we lost the Battle of Gettysburg? Leroy asked. He looked from man to man, searching their faces in the dim firelight. Owens frowned at him. Do you mean to tell us, lad, that where you're from, the North wins? All at once, the men were in an uproar, clamoring at Leroy with their eager questions. What's the future like? How long does it take for us to win the war? Which general does Lincoln pick next? Hell, what happens on the battlefield tomorrow? Stop! Leroy screamed. Just stop it, all of you. That's right, said Owens. Can't you see you're crowding him? Give the man some air. This can't be happening, Leroy thought his head swimming in confusion. Company B, the 20th Maine. They'd only won today because an army of fanatic Union supporters had gone back in time to change history. The charge at Little Round Top, the bravery of men like Lawrence Chamberlain and Patrick O'Rourke, it all seemed so pointless to him now. That moment before the bayonet charge, when the outcome of the war had hung as if from a thread, it had never been that close, because the time travelers would never have allowed it. Then he remembered the Confederate soldier with the time-slip device. The South will rise again. Wait, wait, he said, waving at the others for silence. There's something important I need to tell you. Something that could change everything. What is it, Corporal? Quiet, let him speak. The Alabamans, the 15th and 47th, they've got time travelers in those regiments. Owens frowned, and the others eyed him warily. What do you mean, lad? The Confederates have got time travelers in their army just like we do. Hood's division, Longstreet's corps, who knows what, but Pickett's got them too. General Pickett, isn't he in the Confederate rearguard? I thought he came up too late to be part of the fighting. Sergeant Owens clasped both hands on Leroy's shoulders. This is very important, lad, he said, his expression deadly serious. Of all of us, you're the only one who knows what happens tomorrow. What does Lee plan to do? Pickett's charge. Leroy said, barely aware that the words had left his mouth. The high watermark of the Confederacy. Lee gives Longstreet, Trimble, and Pettigrew's divisions, and together with General Pickett, they charge the center of the Union lines. The men sobered up at once. A Confederate charge at the center of our lines? That could break us! Do the men in the Second Corps know about this? We should call for reinforcements. God knows the Confederates already have. It will be the bloodiest battle ever fought on American soil! It was the bloodiest battle ever fought on American soil, Leroy thought, blood draining from his cheeks once again. The Battle of Gettysburg, almost 50,000 casualties from both sides, and how many of them were time travelers? How many of them had invaded this time from the future, fighting on these hallowed fields of the past? It was too much, too much. Let me go, he yelled, shoving Sergeant Owens to the ground. The men leaped, but he ran past them, fumbling in his coat for the time slip device. The others immediately began to pursue him, but before they could lay hold of him, he set the device forward about 16 hours and engaged. Leroy tripped and fell flat on his face, dropping the time-slip device in the rotting leaves. When he groaned and got up, the hot July sun was burning the back of his neck, and the thunder of dueling artillery resounded across the Pennsylvania hills. The Confederate bombardment before Pickett's charge, he realized, the largest artillery barrage of the war, the ground shook as hundreds of cannons bore down on each other. It was madness, sheer madness. Soldiers from the future fighting a battle in the past. And did Gettysburg even belong to the 19th century anymore? Had it ever? States' rights in the Union, secession and the Constitution, slavery and equality, freedom and independence, the clash of American civilizations and the baptism by fire of democracy in the modern world. Never before, and perhaps never since, would so much of the future hang on so brief a moment in history. And so, here they were, men of the 22nd and 23rd centuries disguised as natives of the 19th to give their lives for the future they had never had. How much of it was even real anymore? 
How much of it was meddling from so many broken timelines? And what if the war itself was merely a fabrication to bring about this great and terrible day? I have to stop it, Leroy decided, rising to his feet as the guns thundered in the distance. I have to pull back the curtain and expose this charade for what it is. He stumbled wildly through the forest, trying to figure out his next move. The artillery barrage would be over within the hour, and the Confederate troops of Longstreet's Corps would begin their terrible charge. There would be a moment of calm as they entered the killing field, and then all hell would descend upon the men of both sides. If he was to stop the battle, he had to get to them before that. He came upon the site of the fighting yesterday, where the fight for Little Round Top had been at its worst. Stillness shrouded the hill today with bodies in blue and gray, littering the ground like rotting leaves. Leroy searched frantically among them until he found a soldier with a shirt that could pass as white. He cut it off the stiffened corpse with a nearby bayonet and fashioned it into something resembling a flag of truce. Then, tying it to the end of a musket, he sprinted back to the Union lines. The guns had stopped, and an unearthly silence descended upon the battlefield. Leroy, short of breath, ran into the camp, I'll never get out of there on foot, he realized. I'll have to ride out on horseback. He found a horse tied next to the colonel's tent. A couple of swarthy soldiers smoked pipes and played cards on a large, flat rock nearby. Leroy didn't bother to see who they were. He untied the horse and leapt into the saddle. What the deuce? Stop him! The horse whinnied and rose up on its hind legs as he spurred it to action. One man grasped at the reins, only to be knocked aside while the other drew his pistol. Moments later, Leroy was galloping down the hillside, bullets shrieking inches from his ears as the flag of truce flapped wildly by his side. He tore past the rocks of Devil's Den and on to the road leading to the wheat field. Rebel skirmishers fired pot shots at him, so he turned off and headed north. Up ahead, at the base of the slopes leading up to Cemetery Ridge, the Virginians of Pickett's division were advancing, their bayonets glistening in the sun. A shout went up from the Union ranks sheltered behind the stone wall at the top. Over the furious pounding of his horse's hooves, Leroy made out the words, Fredericksburg! Fredericksburg! Stop! he yelled. Stop! On the fields ahead of him, thousands of Confederate soldiers marched proudly in their ranks across the wide, deadly space between the armies. It was their greatest moment of glory, the last day of hope for the dream of the Confederacy, and it seemed that all the South had assembled to be there. Stop! Leroy screamed, pulling out onto the Emmitsburg Road. He held up the flag of truce and waved it with all his strength. We're all time travelers! We're all time travelers! Can't you see? We're all... A cannon shell burst in front of him, kicking up great clods of earth and throwing him from his horse. The world around him spun drunkenly and turned dark. He gasped for breath, tasting dirt and blood. He'd lost all feeling in his legs, but that was nothing next to the ringing in his ears. He opened his eyes and saw only blurry, indistinct shapes. The green grass, the blue sky, some gray movement off to his side. Then an explosion sounded nearby, and his mind suddenly cleared. The Union artillery was firing at the rebels, firing and taking them out ten at a time. The whistle of cannonballs and the bursting of shells filled his world, and he covered his head in terror. Now the troops were marching past him, marching in their long, proud lines as the artillery all but decimated them. The rebel yell mingled with the other sounds of battle, and the ground shook not only with cannon fire, but the tread of thousands of feet. The time slip device, Leroy thought weakly. He reached into his coat pocket, but it wasn't there. As his vision cleared and the troops marched around him, he saw it in the grass just out of his reach. An explosion made him duck, casting great clods of dirt all over him. Whether out of courage or desperation, he rallied his strength and crawled on his elbows toward his only means of escape. Just as his hand grasped the time-slip device, a leather-booted foot stomped it down. He looked up at the black-bearded face of a man in gray uniform. We're all... We're all... We're all... Time travelers, the man said. We know. He grinned and cocked his pistol. A burst of smoke, a jolt of pain, and Leroy's time ceased forever. Who are we to say which history is correct? 
Some would say that history is defined not by truth, but by the consensus of our collective memory. And after we pass by the narrative of the next victor. But that is something to be discussed over brandy and cigars when the sun cannot hear. Right now, I need to get a new exhibit ready for July. Something in honor of Gettysburg, I think. There are Civil War reenactors on their road trips to their favorite battlefields this time of the year, and one cannot have a proper journey without a side quest or two. That might attract some new visitors. I'll have a rummage around the attic and see exactly what I can find. Which means it is time for you to go. Do visit us next time at the Gallery of Curiosities. Gallery of Curiosities is produced under a Creative Commons International 4.0 non-commercial attribution, no derivatives license. Don't sell it, change it, or make a transcript. The Questionable Redemption of Thomas Alva Edison was written by Evan Dickin and adapted for radio by Kevin Frost. Thomas Edison was voiced by Wolf Moon. This episode was produced in June of 2018. For full show notes, visit us on the web at gallerycurious.com. It's time for you to go. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Let's try that again.